All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Conversations on Retail. My name is Matt Pfeiffer. We are so excited to have Mike Grain back to continue his series on on-shelf availability. Today, Mike welcomes Pierre-Marie Ralu, the founder and CEO of One Retail AI. Just a couple of housekeeping issues before we get started. First of all, a special shout out to our friends at the University of Arkansas. They have got the number one undergraduate supply chain program in North America for the second year in a row. To learn more, you see a long URL there below, but walton.uark.edu uh, will get you more information. Also, our friends at Westrock Coffee, with offices in 10 countries, the company sources coffee and tea from 35 origin countries. And for more information about this great organization, visit westrockcoffee.com. Also sponsored by BrainCorp and Barcoding. In case you missed it, Mike has put together quite the body of work in the in the six months or so, seven months or so that we've been working on this on-shelf availability series. And if you missed any of these or want to go back and watch them again, you can visit our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at conversations on retail. Super excited today to announce something that Mike and I have been sort of talking about for some time, and that is to create a gathering place and a resource center for the industry's professionals. So on Monday, we'll be launching onshelfavailability.com, where you'll be able to find industry experts, best-in-class service providers, and thought leadership. And for more information about this resource that is still very much coming together, visit onshelfavailability.com. Last thing I would love to say is that this is intended to be a conversation and not a presentation. So we would love for you to participate by uh, asking questions, by offering insight, uh, even pushing back if there's something that you don't 100% disagree with. Just be, We'd love for you to be a part of the conversation. So to do that, click on the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen and Zoom and submit those questions or comments in writing. Last thing I would say, and Mike sometimes hits on this uh, a second time, but it's really important that we all comply with federal antitrust laws. So we're going to refrain from discussing anything related to prices, margins, discounts, suppliers, price changes, all those sorts of things. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, and we're absolutely thrilled to have Pierre here with us. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about our favorite topic, which is on-shelf availability. Not a big surprise since this is what, kind of the, the focus that we've had for quite a while in this space. But before we get into the specifics of it, Pierre, I'd be love to have you kind of unmute, introduce yourself to our audience, and give us a little bit of background on yourself. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me today on the podcast. So uh, my name is Pierre-Marie Ralou, as you just stated. Um, I've been in the retail uh, technology for retail world for about 20 years, um, more or less in the forecasting, replenishment, and supply chain space, in-store, uh, warehouses, and all of the above. Um, I started One Retail AI a couple of years back to uh, help startups, uh, especially focus on AI technology, to grow uh, in, the, in the retail segment, the retail vertical in the U.S., so it has been uh, it's been most of my career has been studying uh, or helping companies grow in that segment so that has been uh, a core a core thing that's outstanding well you and i have something in common i've been doing it for 40 years you've been doing it for 20 years uh, <laughs> i guess the good news and the bad news is we're still employed because it's still an opportunity right <laughs> we haven't quite got figured out even since the first retail store got open we've always got issues with on-shelf availability and Hey, Pierre, one of the things that I always ask my 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 guests on this on this podcast or this uh, conversations on retail is the following question: Take your day job away for a second, put that on the side, put yourself in the shoes of a customer because the all that we can we can we can think about from a technology standpoint, from an AI standpoint, at the end of the day, our best experience is going to be being a customer shopping in a store. So any stories that you could provide to us where you actually, as a customer, went in to purchase a product and were disappointed that it wasn't there. You don't have to call out the retailer or the brand or anything like that, but tell us how you felt through that. What did you do about it, et cetera? It would be pretty interesting uh, to hear. I think I think you want to, there are actually two stories you want to mention here. You want to talk about showing up in the store uh, with a specific need and not finding what you want yeah. and or going online buying something and not getting what you want when it's both of them the are, house. Both, both of them are so painful <laughs> i i have uh I, I have three daughters here who are very specific on, on what they want to eat and, and drink and things like that and 
And, and we shop a lot online. I mean, my wife and I both work, so we, we tend to, you know, use Instacart or Shift or, or directly the, uh, the retailer website. And again, no names. But I would say almost 100% of the time, one or two products are being either substituted or just removed from the delivery. And and I mean, best case scenario is substituted by something which is kind of similar, which is fine. Or worst case scenario, they just uh, move the Nutella to another brand, and that's a disaster in the house. Everything exploding out there. So uh, so so I, I think everybody has has this has this has this experience already. And when you show up at the store, it's uh, there are a couple of things which are which are uh, main pain painful uh, main pain takers for the for the clients. It's really like well, first of all, not finding your products. Uh, it can be the product itself. It can be the brand you want. It can be, uh, uh, the, or just the fact to go and search for the product and, and having to spend 10, 15 minutes to look for the exact product you need. I mean, in, in the grocery store can be pretty large. So those are some of the experiences that uh, that you see that uh, that are uh, that are uh, that are an issue uh, currently in the customer journey. Yeah, and I guess two other things is you know typically if you're looking and you think you already checked the website and they said they had four of them and you go to the shelf and they're not there, the obvious thing is to ask a employee of the of that company, hey, do you have any of these? Well, it says we have four. In those dreaded words, let me go back in the back and look for them, which basically yeah, means right. you'll be standing there for a while before that person probably actually returns. The other one, which is interesting, is either my kids or my wife will look at me and go. Isn't this what you do? Isn't this supposed to be fixed because you guys work on this yeah. stuff all the time? <laughs> so somehow you get thrown. Yeah, not only did I disappoint it because it's not there, but you know somebody throws me under the bus because that's my job to fix that. So, well, that's awesome. Well, I, the the point is, we all are customers as well. So we've all experienced either ordering something online, going to pick it up in store, and it not being there, or going through and getting major substitutions or eliminations of things that you really need in the store. And so part of what we want to spend some time talking about is tech. Now, cer certainly there's a people and a process portion of that and a supply chain, et cetera. There's lots of reasons why things aren't on the shelf. But one of the things that we do is try and work against technology to at least, at least lets people know about that. So tell me about your company. I know you're integrated or working very closely with SES and Magatag. You're part of them now. Tell me exactly what you do with 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 the uh, the company you have now. Sure, yeah. So uh, I started one retail AI a couple of years ago. I mean, in order to work with uh, many startups, as many startups as I can in the retail world, and help them grow in that retail. And as you mentioned, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, there is technology, there is process, and there is people. And actually, it starts with people, and then process, and then technology. Yep. And 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 quite often, I mean, the technology can be really good, but if the technology doesn't fit into the process, and if the people don't use that technology, well, this technology is very useless. Right. And therefore, uh, part of what I'm doing is looking at okay, what does the retail world needs? What makes sense to me? And, and where do I see value? And then I, I, I start working with those companies. For example, I started to work uh, a year and a half ago with, with a startup called BeLive.ai, and they are specialized in computer vision AI. And, the, uh, and, and so basically what they do is you put cameras on the shelf and the cameras is watching the opposite shelf and then taking pictures all the time in near real time. And then there are big AI algorithms behind the scene that are analyzing the products, looking at the, doing deep learning, understanding the products, exactly as you and I recognize a product on the shelf, the AI does the same thing. And then they look at, okay, what is out? What is partially out? What is... Uh, out of place or upside down, all these kind of things, and then help the the, the employees to uh, to to guide them uh, through the store on a real time basis. Help prioritize and stuff. Kind of so I really like the idea, and we will come back. We, we both know super chain, but we'll get back to it. But I really like the idea, and it happened that Belive has been acquired very recently by SES Imagotag, mm -hmm. and to join the, uh, the 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 business unit of computer vision of SES. Mm -hmm. So uh, so now I'm very close to SES, uh, understanding how we are merging the solutions and how we are the, we're, we're building the building that vertical, especially in North America. That's a little bit time. And I, I, and yeah. I just spent, no, I just spent a week actually I just spent a week actually with, uh, with, with the SES leadership team 
uh, in the retreat in France, not too shabby, in the chateau. Oh, uh, it, it only took you 10 minutes to tell me you just got back from Paris. That's just not right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't skip, we will skip the champagne. The, uh, the, but the, 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 the company has a, has a vision, which is very interesting. And, uh, and I think it fits pretty well where, where, where the retail, uh, where re retail world is right now. Yeah, and just, and just for our audience, SES Magatag is an incredible company. I've worked with them quite a bit. I actually worked with them when I was at Walmart with electronic shelf labels, et cetera, uh, bringing, bringing basically digital intelligence to the shelf, right? Whether it's shelf labels, whether it's cameras, uh, in your case, taking that camera methodology and being able to look at the opposite side of the uh, of the aisle and say, because it's really important, everybody say, well, we should be able to look at a shelf and say there's a label and there's no product that that's pretty easy, but there's also, there's a label and there's product, but it's the wrong product. We call those incorrect products or plugs. Uh, we, we see times where the price at the register and the price actually at the shelf in the paper label world environment are different. That's a problem. So uh, talk to us a little bit about your me that methodology of literally using computer vision. I'm saying I'm assuming it's real time computer vision to to identify what the opportunities are on the shelf. Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me give a step back, which one thing which is very important to understand as well is maybe understand some of the forces of the market and why that makes sense now. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you mentioned SES in Magota. It's a company which is actually 30 years old, which is in the technology world like a dinosaur. But in the meantime, it really, really uh, behave as a startup or multiple startup, I would say. And and so the 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 the, the company, as you mentioned, has been um, has been has been known. They're the number one in the world for ESL, so the electronic shelf labels, which is their historical job. But they have recently transformed uh, under the impulse of its uh, CEO Thierry Thierry Gadou, and uh, to, to become a, a a real offer around digitization of the physical store. And what we see right now is, I mean, ESL has been in Europe on the shelf of every grocery store for twenty years. I mean, I grew up with ESL, and I'm not 20 years old. And the uh, and the uh, and, and and surprisingly, I arrived in the US in early 2000, and I didn't see a single ESL anywhere. And as of today, I mean, it's very very rare to find ESLs on the shelf. Yeah, where we talk about we talk about two or three percent market penetration, which is co compared to 60, 65 in in Europe. And and what we see is that the um, the market has evolved itself. The, the the U.S. market has evolved. I mean, under the under the the, the global pressure, the rising labor costs, the energy costs going up, the uh, and, and then the e-commerce, the pressure of the e-commerce to align the experience, the customer experience in the store. All of that is bringing a lot of pressure on transforming the the brick and mortar uh, experience, and 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 a lot of that is. And, and this is why the offer of SES makes a lot of sense because the fact of digitali digi digitalizing the, the store basically realign a little bit the the ecom and the and the and the and the, the brick and mortar uh, stores, physical Got stores. Got it. That's great. That's great so, macro. That's great macro. Yeah, I, I, and and they are and they are and then after of course we can talk about the ESL which is blooming in the US and so being being in that market right now makes a lot of sense. But then above and beyond just the ESL, which are driving dynamic pricing and promotion policies and things like that much faster and much easier, there are a number of technology, including computer vision and AI, that are also going to uh, 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 help dig digitizing that, that store. Yeah. Digitalizing yeah. that store. And to work yeah. on that I, I, know that, I know the electronic shelf labels, and I know that's not your specific area of focus, but, but not only does it provide you consistent pricing and correct pricing uh, at the shelf. To, so that shelf price and the price at the register are the same price versus a different price. But also you're building intelligence into those now where literally if I'm picking items for a customer, as I turn around the corner and I have two of these that I'm looking for, they have LED lights that can blink, you know, blink to me and say, hey, I'm right here, pick right here rather than where is that item? There's a whole bunch of items. I mean, 
when you're talking about great big, you know, things of paper towel, it's not that hard. When you're thinking about cosmetics or things that are very skew intensive, that 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 what we call picking operation becomes easier. And from a stocking yeah. standpoint, allowing an associate or a, a employee to pick out an item, scan the UPC, and have it blink to where it goes, rather than trying to find in a big four foot section where it's supposed to go, uh, I think is a game changer. Let's focus back on the out of stock uh, work because that's the most exciting part of this. So uh, it's exciting time to be part of retail. So where where is AI and computer vision today and where do you see it kind of going in the future? Uh, so let's start in the kind of the U.S. market because I think you're right. It's, it's a little bit behind where Europe is. Where is it today and where do you think it could go in the future? So um, currently what we see – so. If you think about the, the, the supply chain in the, in the retail and most supply chains, the purpose of the supply chain is to bring the right product at the right place at the right price, right? So in the retail world, that would mean, I mean, you want to have the product on the shelf when the when the consumer, when the customer is coming and look, look for it. Well, uh, interestingly enough, almost no retailers can factually know that the product is on the shelf at the time they know it. They might know, best case scenario, they might know they have it in the store, uh, but they don't know if it's on the shelf when the customer is looking for it. And you think about all the effort, the massive resources that are being spent in terms of supply chain logistics to have the, the store, the store people, all the all the all the automation of the replenishment or the, the, the plan of crime automation and so on. And, and still, I mean. Still, we can't say if the product is there. So I think this is what uh, this is that vision that we're bringing with that technology. When I say vision, I'm very about this computer vision that we're bringing. The idea is to have a, an eye on the shelf that looking at those products permanently, real time or near real time, and 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 that are able to address the information that the product is out is low. Or uh, or food, and 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 then being able to drive the store operations and the supply chain in order to uh, improve that uh, stock position. So there they are. So I'm coming back just a little background. I'm coming back to what you said. I mean, I would say Europe and the US are about the same level on this one. ESL is a different ball game for sure. But computer vision, we're talking about an, an emerging technology, and we will come back to it. And so I would say there are players in Europe and players in the U.S. And let's get a tip going at the moment on, on where we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just got a text message from somebody. So I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of off script here a little bit. As you think about a big mass merchandiser, like a Walmart or a Target or somebody, you've got some product on certain parts of the store that computer vision makes all the same. You have other product categories like apparel and maybe electronics, et cetera, that may, may, may be different, right? So how does computer vision, how does confusion, because I don't think computer vision is, is a one-stop you know, solution for everybody. I don't think RFID is a one-stop solution for everybody. How do you see these technologies working together for different kinds of categories like apparel versus boxes of cereal? That's a very good point. So Computer vision is good for what you can see easily. I mean, when you have, do you have a box of cereal on the shelf or not? They have, so, and I, and I will divide that. And then there are areas, as you mentioned, it's very difficult to recognize a black t-shirt size L from a black t-shirt size M just by vision. So th that, that, that is a little bit of a, that's, that's a little bit of the, 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 the limit to a certain degree, but, just, just computer vision itself has been evolving pretty fast, uh, meaning that, uh, for example, I mean, over the last six months, I spent a lot of time on, on produce mm. and, and the capability to actually recognize the produce, uh, making a difference between the banana and the orange and apple, um, understanding uh, the level of inventory of the produce on the shelf. Uh, with this limitation, of course, I mean, but we, we will, uh, and, and understanding also the, the, the ripeness of the product. I mean, is the product, I mean, mature, not mature? Um, how long time has been standing on the shelf? 
So looking because the cameras are looking at the product, I mean, we can see if a product that has a, a use by a shelf life of a couple of hours has been sitting on the shelf for a couple of hours. And then and then there are a lot of uh, business cases that are being uh, being up, uh, that are being developed above and beyond the standard grocery uh, grocery or, or, or GM merchandise or GM uh, GM categories. So so there are there are a number of uh, Number of categories that are that, that are good, uh, very good, uh, good candidates for for computer vision, and then you mentioned um, adding other technologies uh, around the store and 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 the the store digitalization and that's a little bit the idea of ACS is not a one step shop on one technology. You are going to have a number of technologies that are going to be complementary. For example, you can have smart uh, smart pushers that are counting the products on the shelf. Uh, you can have scales that are weighing the product on the shelf. And then when you start having this mix of this mix of technologies, we start having a very a much more accurate visibility of what you have on your in your store. Hmm. Okay, well, so you, you just opened up a very interesting conversation because typically people say, well, computer vision is great. It tells you if the product's on the store, but unlike things like RFID, computer vision can't count. I can see the first one, but I can't see the ones behind it. You just uncovered something, those pushers, the weight sensors. Talk to us a little bit about the role that they play in not only the product is available, but how many are on the shelf. And it also could ge generate a signal to a store associate saying, hey, by the way, a new case can now fit. It couldn't fit a few minutes ago, but it can now fit. Walk to us through that. Well, this example of the case no, uh, shows that you know retail pretty well. I mean, understanding that you have one or two cans of soup is one thing. Understanding you have room for a new case of soup is another thing. Right. Because when we think in terms of replenishment, I mean, we don't buy it by the skew, right? We buy it by the by the PCB. We buy it by the case or the pack. And so and so and so there is there, are, there are, this is the this is the this is the this is where you, this is where the replenishment is, is understanding replenishment is very important. It's not just a number of understand the exact quantity which is on the shelf rather than is it the time to order a new pack or not. And, and so when you think about just computer vision, what can a computer vision do? Well, computer vision is going to look at the holes on the shelf. They're going to look at uh, if a product is, is, uh, is low or not. We can see that if there's one facing of two facing or three facings. Um, and, and the computer vision will be able to, uh, to understand if a product is not at the right place or not. Okay, right. if you have your planograms, you're supposed to have two facings, and suddenly you have three or four because you're missing the product on the on, on, on the side. I mean, that makes sense. And so those are some of the business cases that computer vision can solve. And then it's going to guide the uh, the employees toward what actually matters. Um, because at the moment, if you look at the standard grocery store, why every day you go you go and go and scan your gaps and check if am I my zero? Do I have a quantity on hand? Is it going to be delivered today? But you have to go and check your your your, your scanning your gaps on a regular basis. The problem of doing that is even if you manage perpetual inventory, well, when you look at the shelf, you don't know if there is perpetual inventory and, and, until you check it. Well, that's what computer vision will do for that. We're gonna they're gonna receive the the file of your balance on hand. And compare that with what you have on the shelf, and just manage the exception. So suddenly, you don't, suddenly you don't have to scan the two, three, four thousand uh, holes you have on the shelf, but just maybe the five or six hundred that are actionable in the store. Hmm. And when I say actionable, maybe they're on the back room, maybe they're on the riser if you have an inventory on the riser, or maybe the the the, the, the quantity is wrong, and then you need to adjust the quantity. And when you do that on a daily basis, boy, well, you start to you start. To, uh, to have a much leaner replenishment. When every day you correct your balance on hand, and we can talk about why there are balance on hand discrepancies, but when every day you are cleaning your, uh, your stock in, in the store, well, your replenishment gets better. Your replenishment gets better, gets leaner. Uh, your, your out of stock goes down, but your inventory level goes down as well because you don't have excess inventory. And all of that drives a much leaner supply chain because your your demand, which is the store, is much more accurate. Okay, perfect. To come back to you, the second part of your question, just finishing, you okay. were asking about the, the pushers. Well, yes. the pushers are going to, and the RFID as well, or everything which is attached to the unit will be able to actually count the product. And counting the product is a very important, in, in a very important information, especially in specific categories. 
I mean, if you go in cosmetics with very high margin, high price products, well, I mean, a case is expensive. So you want to make sure that you are ordering at the right point. So knowing the number of products you have in those categories, pharmacy, cosmetics, and then we can go in apparel as well. I mean, we have different way of counting the counting the, the, the product on the uh, on the on the on the hanger. And so and so those technologies provide a much more granular visibility on the count. And that granularity enables even more uh, more precision in your replenishment. Got it. So JW has asked basically a, a really good question. I think from from my perspective, his, his he was interested in. Hey, give me the one. Give me one or two or three use cases for computer vision AI versus kind of what the typical Rain RFID, which is basically UHF RFID, uh, that a re- retailer might choose. What, what are those use cases from a computer vision that you think stand out as a differentiator? Well, first of all, as far as I know, I know only one chain that has enabled RFID across all its product in its entire chain. Uh, and and that, uh, that's Decathlon, the sporting goods uh, Decathlon, chain. Yep. Yep. And, 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 and their experience is fantastic. I mean, you pick whatever you want in the, in the store, everything, 100% of the products are RFID. And then you go through uh, through the gate, and then it, it flashes the RFID, and then it bills you. So you still have to go and billing in that case, but no counting, no need to put. I mean, this is a fantastic experience. But they it was enabled for it, they were able to enable it for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, the Sporting Goods Company. So I mean, you are not talking about uh, you're talking about fairly high price uh, mm-hmm. per per skew in general, um, and they are almost. I don't know the exact number, but they have a very high uh, level of private labor. They manufacture probably 50% or more of their goods. Mm-hmm. So since they manufacture, well, they embed the RFID from the manufacturing process. And then they spend a lot of time for those other 50% to RFID themselves in the warehouse. So that's an investment yep. uh, that seems to be paying at the store level. So RFID is great, but if you take a Walmart, that have, I don't know, 120,000 SKUs. A lot of them are very low cost. I mean, enabling the RFID is very complicated. It's actually not done at all. And, and therefore, therefore, well, we look at computer vision because that's much easier to enable. It's much more realistic in the store at the moment and uh, provide a, a, a mass solution. So ideally, everything would be RFID and then life is great. Well, reality of the supply chain is different. So, uh, so, so, and, and concerning the business case, what was really what I mentioned earlier is really like being able to uh, be super specific on how to get organized in the store based on the knowledge and the data we have. What, what computer vision does is it brings a new set of data, which is the presence of the product on the shelf constantly. And, uh, and, 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 and the idea, and the idea is really to be able to change the paradigm of having people which are maybe dedicated to grocery or dedicated to GM that have to know their product, maybe with a more versatile uh, workforce in the store, uh, which is more task driven, more uh, rather than uh, rather than schedule driven. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So again, I uh, got a text from somebody. So so this may be a little bit uh, a question that you weren't really expecting, but I think it's an important one. There are other solutions that are computer vision solutions that mm-hmm. either are crowdsourcing, i.e. go and take the picture and do the analysis there. I'm thinking of things like field agent tracks, et cetera. There's also a suite of solutions which are robotics based, you know, Badger robot, brain robot, Symbi robot, some of those folks who are literally scanning items on the shelf and reporting that same back. Obviously, fixed cameras is a different solution. Walk us through the differences between somebody taking the picture versus a robot catching the picture versus fixed cameras uh, from your point of view. Yep. So th- there are there are pros and cons in every technology. I think I've, I've been playing with a little bit all of them. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and I landed on fixed cameras. But mm-hmm. so when you talk about, when you talk about <laughs> uh, pictures uh, using a mobile phone and things like that, 
the uh, the advantage of that picture that you have the flexibility to have a very neat picture read in front of what you want to focus on so so and and then and and it's very it's a very light solution there's not a lot of investment up front because you don't have to install anything uh, but you need people to do that mm -hmm. and and the fact of having the 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 folks doing that well that has a recurring cost which is extremely high which is the folks taking the picture and from uh from most of the 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 the, the, the brands that i've worked with like coca-cola cheers uh and coca-cola <laughs> on this day or those guys my my wife works at coke so we have a ton of things there but uh <laughs> so, so, disclaimer uh the uh but a lot of the feedback i had is the lack of consistency mm. of the pictures Mm -hmm. I mean, you're gonna take, you're gonna take, uh, they're gonna, they're gonna take big, because you have, you have an army of people that are there, which are taking two pictures. So you need to train them. Taking your picture is easy, but taking the right picture so the AI can analyze the, 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 the right data. I mean, uh, do I have the right frame? Do I see everything? Do I, do I, do I, do I consistently take, uh, don't, didn't I miss uh, one of the shelves or two shelves or something like that? And a big, uh, one of the issue I've heard about is consistency. After consistency, it's not a big deal if the business case is around, for example, merchandising, because merchandising doesn't require as much velocity as inventory. So you can have a view of your shelf once a week or once every two weeks. And, and statistically, you can start looking at, okay, am I compliant? Am I not compliant? What's, and, and things like that. And so for merchandising, especially for the brands, I mean, that's a situation that seems to make sense. Now, sure. th there are a lot of brands that we talk to that want more, that want to have much more detailed KPIs, that want to understand the inventory position of their products, that want to understand the dynamic of the product, like a heat map, how fast is the product moving during the day? Because that's what, that's what fixed camera can do, right? They're taking pictures all the time. So they can analyze, even if the product's not out, whether the product moved, whether the product removed and put back and, and create a heat map of the interaction between the client and the shelf. So mm -hmm. the effective, the effectiveness of the merchandising, if you want. So that's one thing. The other thing is you mentioned the, the robots, uh, you mentioned Simbe, I mean, uh, we sponsored by Brain. So um, the, the the robots also have a, have a great, uh, a great value in the sense that when they are, they are, first of all, they are very close to the shelf. They they have a very nice. They can they, they usually they have very nice sensors with good lenses. They can uh, they can analyze, read the barcode and everything. So there are, there are a lot of information uh, associated with the robot, and they can run continuously in the store. That said, a robot will give you uh, a, a picture position once or twice a day at the maximum, mm -hmm. uh, unless you have an army of robots. But I don't think that's the point. And so, and so, it's it's going to give you one or twice a day inventory position, which is good, and as well as merchandising position. So I think the part of the part of having the robot is 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 interesting is is interesting for that perspective. After there is the the there is the the the, the the customer perception of the robot in the store. Some like, some don't. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's, that's one thing. And, and the fact that you also have a, uh, a potential signal point of failure. The robot doesn't start. I mean, it won't work at all today. So if, if, you, if you're looking for like a, if you're looking for like a, uh, some a solution that gives you, a, uh, really looking for to tackle your out of stocks, I, I, I personally think the, uh, the, 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 the the, the shelf the shelf eight cameras are, are the best uh, but if you're just looking for to take a, a merchandising pain point or, or or a branding pain point well then uh, then those solutions might work got it got it well let's go back to let's go back to the solution that you offer you've obviously done a lot of research about this tell us some what the and we already talked about the fact that it's not just technology there's a people component there's a process component there's a technology component what's best practices if somebody was trying to do computer vision to generate a list of auto stocks or incorrect products etc for their team whether it's your solution or somebody else's what are the best practices to utilize to to, to put that in and make that work so um in the in in the 
in the world of SES, for example, I mean, there is the world of, I mean, do we have share, uh, do we have, for example, ESLs or not on the on the on the on the on the shelf? And that's that's, that's fine. But having ESLs, as you mentioned earlier, well, get the price and promotions, velocity, and things like that. But they also sync with the cameras, and and uh, and and it and it and it helps the cameras to uh, to always stay in sync. In the meantime, uh, the AI algorithm uh, are analyzing the products in near real time as well, so it can work in both in both uh, both worlds. In terms of in terms of how do we make that happen, the the technology itself works. I mean, there is, there's no problem, but on the fact that it's going to find your your it's going to find your hole, it's going to work. Or at least for the one I've tested and I and I know pretty well, the, the one within the CS framework, they work pretty well. So the technology works. But as I mentioned earlier, I mean, it's people, process, and technology. And having a, the you can have the best tool in the world if you don't know how to use it, then it's pretty useless. So. So what, what we've seen is it's very important for uh, for uh, for a retailer and also for the vendor to work together. I mean, uh, my, my team spent a lot of time in, in the store uh, with the store managers, try to understand, for example, what's the day in the life of the before, before the technology? What's the day in the life look like? And you could imagine like every grocery store is the same. Wow, every grocery store is slightly different. Yeah. And so, and the devil is in the details. So spending the time to understand the process, the existing process, and then looking at how the technology can actually bring the value. You don't need to bring a, a revolution. Uh, I mean, that you can start with an evolution. And, and then, then looking forward with multiple evolutions, you're gonna bring a revolution eventually. Um, and the other thing which is super interesting with those technologies, and I'm, and I'm looking at most of the in-store IOTs that we have, you can test them pretty easily. It doesn't require to have IT teams involved, having hundreds of interface and integration built. I mean, it can be light touch on the technology. It will be light touch on the technology. And then you can test in one store or two stores or a couple of stores uh, to, see, to see the value. And the... Uh, and 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 today, a lot of I mean, if you look at the spectrum of the retail uh, in North America, well, you have the biggest retailer in the world, but you also have a a very large number of local retailers. I mean, small to mid size, who might think they don't have the bandwidth to 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 go with that kind of technology. But I mean, respectively, I mean, I've been in the software business for 20 years, and it's much easier to install, for example, a computer vision, a camera, a computer vision, than having an, an, a perpetual inventory and, and store replenishment in place. Just because in terms of technology, it's much, in terms of data, it's much lighter touch to start with. It's easy to install, it's physical, you can see it, and you can see the result quickly. So, so best practice, I would say, well, first of all, try it. Don't don't feel free to try it. And and the other thing is that cost wise, um, we were not where we were five to six years ago. The technology five or six years ago was three times more expensive and was working a quarter or a tenth of what it does today. So we're in a much better place than, than we were five years ago. And um, and and the other thing and 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 again minimum investment in terms of IT and and and, and data. So I think I think that's a. Uh, that's something that's very uh, that's very important to keep in mind for all the retailers out there. Okay, excellent. So you've told us what the best practices are. Again, promoting your Coca Cola from your wife—that's awesome. A little friendly sponsorship there. Um, what are the watchouts? <laughs> There's a brand here, by the way. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what are the watchouts? What What are the things that people do that get them into trouble? They try and leverage the technology, but they just make mistakes. What are the, some of the common mistakes you've seen been made when they're trying to impl implement these solutions? Well, I think that I mean I've talked to I've talked to retailers that have a, a, a very preconceived idea of what they wanted to achieve, and that was not exactly what the technology was designed for. And yeah. so trying to and and trying to get out of the the, the boundary is possible, but it's a, it, it requires a partnership. Mm -hmm. Then you have to go. You have to be ready to go through the journey of, I mean, you know, exploring uh, emerging emerging technology boundaries, and it can be painful. I mean, believe me. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so well, one of the boundaries to to understand, okay, what are the existing business cases? What has happened at there? What works? Uh, 
cold deals or retailers, try to understand what they do and, and, and what is being done. I think it's one thing. The other thing is to, uh, to go a step further and making sure you work with a partner, a vendor, that is going to spend the time with you, again, as mentioned, to get in the store, know your processes, know, know what happened. I, I mean, again, that type of technology, we are still, we, we are not in the, in the cookie cutter type of technology where it implements, you, you do it. It's still a bit tailored. Uh, doesn't have to take, I mean, months and weeks and months and things like that, but at least doing the initial assessment of what's your day-to-day, -day, what's the impact on your process, doesn't have to be huge, but needs to be done. I think that's important. The other thing is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can start with very limited data set, but what comes with very limited data set is limited business case in front of it. So for example, if you put a camera, you fit the you fit the system with your list of products, okay, and then you're going to start uh, start crunching the data and give you okay where are the ads, okay. Well, technically, you can go on the shelf, scan yourself, and you see where the ads are, right? So it gives you that visibility without having to walk the shelf, which is a great great value already. Now, if you have the capability to bring to fit the system with your inventory, well, it's going to benchmark what you have on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And what you're supposed to have on your shelf. And it's going to tell you, hey, go and check those 50 products because you have you have stock on that product, but it's empty on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So so they give you a much better business case because now you're narrowing the scope of the product that you need to check. Now, if you also feed the system, and, and I mean these are these are relatively simple set of data, but if you're feeding the system with average sales, for example, now the system instead of only telling you measurement around out of stock, out of stock, sorry, and out of stock duration is going to give you potential lost sales, which mm -hmm. is a much better KPI than just the out of stocks because having a, an out on a high velocity product, high margin product is much more impacting than having an out on a product that doesn't turn. Yep. And so what you want to check is, is focusing on what is essential and, uh, and what makes sense. And, and therefore, I mean, being able to get some of those data ready, you can unlock more business cases. And then after you can integrate the planogram, do the planogram compliance, you can do the, the price and promo checks and things like that. There are much more you can you can involve with that technology as well. Yep. So I know that you know this person pretty well. So she's asking this question. I'm not. But Susie Monfort has asked, how do you track uh, uh, inventory that's in the back room? Well, that's a very, very, very good point. So <laughs> that's yeah, probably why she. Me. That's probably why she asked it. She's wicked <laughs> smart in this spot. She spent a lot of time exactly, with Kroger. Yeah. She knew that that was going to be a very tough question. So take it over to you. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are multiple ways to do. I mean, well, of course, I mean, Suzy knows retail pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> it's an euphemism. <laughs> the uh, the um, uh, the to the number one, the number one. I mean, problem in the in the in the grocery store that you might know your quantity on hand more or less. Usually, usually balance on hand is no more accurate than seventy five, eighty five percent. If so, that, yep. but you, you can you can you can yeah, if that you can so you can know what you have on hand, but you don't know where this is in the store, and mm -hmm. you have the back and the front, obviously, and on the front you might have multiple locations. You have your end right. caps, you have your main location, your primary location. And maybe two uh, secondary locations, so you might have multiple locations as well. So, in knowing what you have in the in the in the what you have in the back is interesting, obviously, because like I mean that tells you what to transfer, what to transfer it, and things like that. Now, if you're in the if you're in the warehouse with a very high velocity, uh, sorry, in the grocery store, for example, with a very high velocity turn. The pallets comes from the warehouse or from the DSD. I mean, those pallets are always multi-products, right? So, uh, so they come in. Usually, usually they come in. They they go straight to the floor, and then they might come back with whatever leftovers are. But there are multiple type of retailers there. So, if you have standard grocery, I work with stand, I work with many grocery stores that have a very very lean back room. They really have don't have a lot. And the policy is that, okay, if you have less than the case, it has to stand the shelf. If you have more than the case, bring it back. If you bring it back on the case, then it can be organized on, on the back room. And if the back room is relatively well organized, then you can, uh, then you can have different systems to uh, measure the, the, 
to measure the, uh, the, level, the level of inventory you have in the back row. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be at the skew because it's at the case, but at least you can recognize this case pack as you recognize the, uh, the, the, the skew on, on, on the front. So that's one possibility. And then you also have, I mean, depending on the type of retail, uh, for example, if you look at a pharmacy, I mean, I'm uh, very close to a very large chain of pharmacies and their back room are extremely well organized. So, um, so it's kind of easy to, uh, it's easy to track uh, what's in the back as soon as you get organized in the back room. So understanding what's in the back room, there are multiple, you can, uh, then after you can use scale, depending on your type of retail, you can use uh, cameras, you can, uh, you can, there are many ways to measure, but ultimately it's a matter of labor versus return. It's always a matter of labor versus yep. return. So uh, for some categories, it can be really interesting. For some others, there's zero value to try to, to count what's in the back. So, uh, so that, that's a little bit. And then the fact of scanning what's from the back to the front is extremely consequent. Nobody does that. I mean, we've tried that. It's extremely labor consuming and that's not something which is possible. So, so, uh, so ultimately, uh, ultimately the idea is that keep in the back just your cases and things like that. Uh, keep on the front when you need, but more importantly, get a much leaner, more accurate replenishment based on your balance on end, so you don't have to keep much in the back. And so if your back room is not packed and fairly empty, it's very easy to visually uh, prepare everything. So after it's a matter of yeah. organization. Okay. It was a tricky so, question, Susie. Yeah, no, it was a good question. Um, very good question. So I would also argue, and I'd love to hear your reaction to this. I would also argue the retailer is not the only customer of this data. But as you start to, you mentioned direct store delivery. If I was Coca-Cola, I would love to know how much Coca-Cola is at the cooler at the front of the checkout, how much Coca-Cola is on the sales floor where it's supposed to be bought, how much is in the back room of the store before I ever arrive in the store. So do you see there's an opportunity to share some of this data with suppliers, whether they're direct store delivery or otherwise? Because that's insights of what's going on in the store that I don't think CPG companies have ever had before. That's absolutely correct. No, I mean the traction, the traction uh, of the CPGs on that technology is massive. Okay. Uh, it's it's uh, and, and again, it, the, most of the big CPG have used uh, mobile uh, mobile uh, mobile CV, mobile computer vision, and AI and stuff like that. But having uh, having a consistent visibility and and having an AI engine that recognizes each location, each product in each location in the store, and then can monitor, okay, what's my, what's the, the, the velocity of my shelf? How does it turn? What's my level of, uh, what's my level of out? Um, another measure which is really interesting is the recurrence of the out, meaning is my uh, merchandising uh, appropriate? Uh, if a product is out twice a day, well, you have an issue. If the product is, is out, three times a week, then you have a replenishment issue. And then, and then, and then doing those analytics is going to bring, bring a huge amount of data to those CPGs. The, the thing is, if you look at, if you look at the, the most, most of the DSD, I mean, I, I'm always shocked by the amount of DSD product that are in the back rooms. Mm, uh, yeah. This is, I mean, I would say 50% of the back rooms, I, okay. For all the backrooms I see, almost fifty percent of the backroom is filled with DSD product, and, and yes, some of, many of them are high velocity. I understand that, but that still seems a lot of inventory on on, on the backroom compared to what's coming from the warehouse, for example, or the, the distributor. Yeah. Yep. Well, in a lot of cases, those direct store delivery folks are paid for and compensated based upon how much product that I move off of my truck to the store, whether it's on the back room or the sales floor. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the problem with reward systems as they work. Right. I think we had this discussion a hundred thousand times now. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's funny because every retailer is like, yeah, I know it's a problem. And, and <laughs> yeah. And, and that, that's, uh, that's interesting. Well, and well, anyway, but so yeah, so to go back to your point, Traction yeah. from CPG is huge. And yeah. what we see now, I mean, and, and looking at, part, for example, one of the things on the SES platform is having uh, a, 
a portal for the vendors to go and see those data and, and oh. API is readily available for them to digest those data. Got so it. all of that's already packaged. I mean, where the retailer wants to see by department and categories and things like that, or the CPG will want to see his brands. And so uh, and so it's, it's a different vision. And, uh, and, and, and for the retailer, there is obviously a monetization around that. Yep. Data is not free, right? Yep. The, the way I think about it, I'm, I'm, I'm from Arkansas, so I'm a pretty simple thinker. Uh, here's the way I think of it. A retailer should know exactly what they have, and they should know exactly where it's located in a retail store. But here's the but. Without a single associate or, uh, or um, person at the store collecting data. So I'm not scanning anything. I'm not wanting anything. I'm, I'm going to let your system work in conjunction with other systems to say, here's what I have, and here's here's where it's located at a high degree of accuracy, not 60% accuracy, but 95% of accuracy. Now, yep. running AI engines to take that data and create tasks for the, uh, the employee to go get that product and stock it because it's in the back room and not on the sales floor or... The Coke person, your, your your wife works for Coca-Cola. Before I even get to the store, I should have a heat map of the store that says exactly how much by SKU I've got. So what do I need to bring into my truck? I don't have to come in and take inventory first. I don't have to go fill out the back room with a product because uh, I just want to make sure that's all there. I, I have the opportunity to create and deliver product directly to the associate. That to me is one of the visions that I would have if you share that data with the CPG companies. Yeah, it, it, and it's and it's really really close. I mean, I've seen uh, I've seen from the R and D team, I've seen uh, I've seen solutions of the, what we call the the, the digital twin. So mm -hmm. really, I mean, uh, that tells you. I mean, that's looking at the store as it is really now with the cameras and the sensors, which are remapping automatically the entire store in three D. And that can tell you where the hotspots are. Hotspots, where are the where the the outs are, yep. and on the shelf, but on the macro as well as on the micro. And all of that being redesigned completely automatically. This is, I mean, the I mean, you have to see that by the way. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. But the uh, but but it's it's really like we have the cameras taking the pictures, and then the cameras know their positioning in the store on the footprint, and they are building a three D view of the store where you can walk in and see the actual shelf so the fact that we can do that is is well i mean it's, it's cool to see that i mean but it also implies that we have a level of data which is can be shared and which are completely actionable where mm -hmm. in the store th think about differently think about your consumer well i'm looking for my coke i don't know where it sees and then i go on the on the retailer app and as a i type i, I type Coke, and then the system tells me turn right, turn left, and you're there. Yep. And it, by the yep. way, and it's on the shelf. Yep. And so, uh, and so that is a, a huge gain. Same thing for the personal shoppers. We talk about e-com. One of the there, there are two areas where where the, the the technology is 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 bringing a revolution to e-com. First of all, well, I mean, being able to tell a consumer if a product is out at the time of placing the order. So I mean, that would be understanding it won't be refilled by then. Um, that might be a strategy, uh, but uh, even more importantly, uh, making sure that the personal shoppers is uh, is notified of all the exceptions before it starts its tour. Mm -hmm. So, so because what's extremely expensive when you have personal shoppers in the store, which are which are which are uh, building the baskets, is every exception requires a quite complex uh, decision making process. Do we substitute, or first of all, do we have it in the store? Yep. If we don't have it, but if we have it in the store, we need to call someone, go and check and say like that. If we and then and then the personal shopper is not producing sometimes. If the if the product's not in the store, what do we do? Do we uh, do we just scratch it or do we substitute? What do we substitute with? So the process is complicated. So removing that exception management from the from the from the personal shopper store is a huge benefit for the for the retailers and yeah. and and the, and the and the shoppers in general. Got it. So we had spots part of it, yeah. Okay. So another great question from our friend JW. Outside of the retail store, think more upstream in the supply chain, warehouses, distribution centers, et cetera. 
Do you also see opportunities, AI or computer vision, AI opportunities uh, in those locations as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, I think that computer vision and AI is the, the next revolution. I mean, uh, the, 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 really, the, it's a huge technical revolution for many, many areas. I mean, I focus on retail because I've been there for 20 years and I'm lazy. I don't want to change. But, the, uh, <laughs> but, the, but if you think about it, uh, I mean, take the Teslas. I mean, they, they are like, they have massive computer vision everywhere. In the warehouse, yes, of course you can go in the warehouse. For example, we've, uh, we, we've done, uh, we, we are working in, in uh, little, uh, little uh, autonomous stores, but for B2B, for warehouses. For example, we have a client which is a manufacturer of uh, plumbing, uh, plumbing hardware, and they put those little pots, it's like in a container. They put them everywhere uh, in the country where the, the plumbers can go and scan, get in, take whatever they want, get out. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is the fact that we have computer vision, uh, there's scales waiting uh, for the nuts and bolts because with computer vision, that's the limit. So, and this is where we start having the different technology. And we also have the, the price tag on it because every time they scan, um, in less than 30 seconds, the entire store prices are refreshed to their own price because they have they have negotiated price. So right. it's, a, it's a B2B, it's a B2B exception. In the warehouses, you're gonna find a lot of a lot of technologies which are, I mean, again, the scales, uh, the tags, the blinking, you mentioned the blinking, the peak to light. Um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of technology that are, that are going to be used. Computer vision can be used to deto to detect defaults, defaults on the shelf, to uh, say, well, oh, there's a screw missing. There are things missing. And this is when, and, and in, in a different environment, you can also think about a different process. Drones might be a good solution. If you have a drone that have like a regular tour, uh, checking all the fixtures, checking the inventory on the, on the third or fourth row, and those kind of things, I mean, that, that, that's absolutely, uh, I mean, this is not, I mean, it's, it's not 10 years from now, it's now. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, believe it or not, we're almost out of time. Uh, it feels like we just got started. <laughs> uh, let me ask you one kind of final question. Um, the question is, and this is my one of my favorite questions at the end, what's hot right now? What's, what's, what's a question that I should have asked you, but I didn't, right? So what's on your mind or any closing thoughts that you might have uh, or anything that uh, you'd like to share that uh, wasn't necessarily a question that you got asked? Well, my, my conviction is my conviction is is that in the years to come, I mean, technology uh, will drive the, the acceleration of the evolution toward a uh, I don't you like the word or not, but a digital retail store, like a really like a very highly digitalized physical store, uh, which is fast, efficient, and convenient. Um, we we have. I mean, during the, today we've talked a lot about how we improve the process in the store. I think we didn't talk too much about the customer experience, mm. and uh, and well, we implied it. I mean, if you find your product on the shelf, you have better experience. Yeah. But I think I think a lot of the technology will will be geared toward customer experience. The store the store of the future will be both a showroom for the clients to find new experiences and a storage. For the e-com to be able to fulfill the, the the orders, and and therefore, boy, you need to marry those two visions. And and how do you how do you and, and how you transform your your customer experience in the store is uh, is definitely what's going to determine determine the, the the winners from the losers tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, we didn't even we didn't even scratch the surface of the, of the customer yeah. journey, but. At the end of the day, that's why we're all trying to make sure the products are avail available for them uh, when, when and where they want them. So, Pierre, thank you so much. Uh, I know you've, uh, you're a little bit jet lagged. You've been on a plane all day. You just got back I'm into uh, Atlanta, your home. Uh, we definitely appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Boy, computer vision, AI, the things that you're doing are, are really, really breakthrough. And it's really exciting to see the digit digitization of the store shelf really come to life. So we thank you for that very much. Uh, we'll have your uh, LinkedIn bi uh, bio as part of our podcast out there. So if people want to get in touch with you for any reason, they can do that. So thank you very much. Have a great weekend. And again, thanks for your time. Thank you, Mike. Have fun. All right. Bye-bye. 